Hi, mamas. I hope this is working. I've never done a Zoom call with myself and recorded it. Um, but here we are using the internet machine like boss babes in 2021 because we had so much practice in 2020. Um, I'm Ingrid and I um, was so excited when I talked to Brooke and she invited me to come and chat with you guys and kick off your spring semester of mops. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I um, my name's Ingrid and I started the Evening Mops group four years ago at Red Rocks, which was um, just such a gift to me. I was just so glad that we could provide something in the evening, uh, mostly for working moms, although I know it, it works with other uh, moms' schedules who work inside their homes. Um, so, I um, have a huge heart for this ministry and I am beyond delighted that Brooke and her team still decided to host MOPS this year, despite everything that has happened. It's very brave of them. So um, when you see them next, let them know that because I'm not sure I could have done that. Um, huge props there. Um, so I I grew up in, in Colorado, born and raised here. Um, and then I went out east for college, met my husband, um, moved back here eventually, and now have two kids. Uh, Malin, she's four, and Anders is two, and that will be it if it's up to me. Um, but my promise to my husband has always been that I will stay open, and he should also stay open <laughs> to being done. Um, but I, um, I, also work for a real estate company um, here in the Denver area. So I am a working mom um, and I just have a huge heart for this ministry and what it provides um, for so many. So thank you for having me um, in your groups. And when I, when I talked to Brooke, she asked me to kind of talk a little bit about my experience last year um, with obviously COVID and everything that's gone on and all the unrest, um, but then to maybe share something that's been on my heart. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, talk to you a little bit about um, what my years looked like, and maybe you can relate in some ways and then shed some light on something I've learned in this past year. So um, COVID hit in March and then in May, um, Travis and I, my husband, were so sick of being at home that we decided to go on a month-long camping trip around Colorado, and it was amazing. So we were still working, um, which was the most difficult part, obviously. It would have been nice to just camp and not work, um, but that wouldn't have worked, and um, it was just really fun to connect with the kids in a totally different way. Um, so we definitely found a lot of silver lining during COVID, which was nice. Um, we, I am not somebody that does well with isolation, but I did well in that environment with, um, other people and kind of moving every couple days, um, all, all done safely. Of course we, um, you know, did all of our own stuff, but, um, that, that really is how COVID started for us. And, um, we kind of really viewed it as some silver lining and then, um, Unfortunately, my um, sister-in-law, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law live right behind us, literally like right behind us, share a fence behind us, which is a huge gift. I know not everyone could live behind their sister-in-law, but I can, she's awesome. Um, we just love them, but his, uh, my brother-in-law's mom was diagnosed with cancer and given a very, very short time to live, which was heart-wrenching because they also were pregnant with their first child, and it would have been his mom's um, uh, only grand grandchild. He lost his dad a year and a half ago. And so then at that point, like COVID kind of turned for us and it started to feel really icky, right? Um, nobody could go see her um, completely just sealed off from everything. And um you know, unfortunately she did, she did pass away before, um, little Miss Blakely was born. And so I really, um, really kind of turned sour there at the end. And then everything that's gone on with the world has just been pretty difficult for me. I'm an Enneagram eight. Anybody 
any of your mates? Be brave, raise your hands if you're in your groups. <laughs> There's few of us. Enneagram eight women are typically um, misunderstood a lot, um, especially in a professional setting. They don't get a lot of slack, but um, I have a huge heart for people who I feel like are oppressed. And so um, Black Lives Matter movement and all that stuff really kind of tainted that last part of the year. So one of the great things though, that came out of last year and actually came out of stepping away from MOPS at the time, I didn't know that, um, made that decision in kind of January, February. Um, and then in July found an opportunity to go to a fellowship program with the Denver Institute for Faith and Work. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that was a big turning point for me last year. Um, so how do we recover? right? From something like this. Literally nobody knows because no one's ever done it. Nobody can say, oh, this is what I did. Um, it's different for all of us, but I think what it really revealed um, to each person was cracks and walls. So things that you're falling into and things that you couldn't hurdle um, as a result of, of all this isolation. Um, and really what it did for me was reveal some places that I need to reintegrate with God's plan for my life. Like, what is your actual plan? Um, he has this plan, right? He knew COVID was going to happen. Like, is this really your plan? <laughs> this plan sucks. Um, and so I, I kind of arrived there and um, just as Egypt reintegrated after the plague, um, all, all the plagues of Egypt. Um, and then also after Jonah um, and his little whale escapade and reintegrates with God. Um, when, Jen, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, basically he's then allowing God to come down and use the gifts God already gave him to change an entire, an entire um, world. I mean, quite honestly. But um, that was a submission on Jonah's part, right? To say, okay, finally, yes, like, please, I will go. Um, so I promise I'm not going to talk to you tonight a little about how to change God's uh, mind and all of those things. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the things that I learned about um, gifts that God's given us and our responsibility um, to use them. So let's pray. Um, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for these women, for each and every one of them, for the call on their heart to join this ministry, um, just to be with one another, to lift each other up, to be in community, knowing full well that this, um, this ministry was going to be difficult to make connection. And they still rose their hand and said, yes, this is what I need. Lord, come and help me be in community. So I thank you for um, how brave they are. And I just ask you to bless them, bless each and every one of them, their babies, their spouses, their partners, um, whoever they're doing life with, just a, a sweet blessing over them um, is what I would love and be in our time tonight. Lord, speak through me. Let these words be yours and not mine. Let them rest on the hearts of these moms and um, let us walk out of here feeling renewed. Amen. So um, I mentioned a fellowship program that I became involved in. Um, it's a nine month fellowship and it's with the Denver Institute for Faith and Work. Um, their mission is to form women and men who serve God, their neighbor and society through their work. So they do that with a bunch of like, um, you read essays and um, do discussion, which is right up my alley. And I love that part. There's also projects that feel like homework, which are not really my jam, um, but lots of spiritual disciplines and scripture, um, you know, developmental plans, you meet with cohorts and triads and all these things. And it really is a rich program for anybody who's ever curious about how to integrate your faith in your work. I highly recommend it. Um, but their entire institution has great resources. They have women's conferences and all kinds of good stuff. So um, shameless plug there, because I really do love them as an organization. But one of the big things that I got out of it early on was that it completely rearranged the way that I viewed gifts and gifts specifically that God has given me. Um, and basically my responsibility in this life to utilize them. 
So um, what is a gift? I think all of us think to some extent that a gift is free. I know I did, um, but they're not. So keep in mind like your, okay, I'll use my own example, my mother-in-law's tchotchkes. Um, anyone have a mother-in-law that likes to give them tchotchkes? Yeah, my mom, my mother-in-law works at Mardell, bless her soul. Um, and she's just, she was like made for retail and she loves all that stuff and the willow sculptures and figurines and she loves to give them and loves bookmarks and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, not really my jam, but when she gives them to me, I feel a full responsibility to use them, to take them out, to put them up for Christmas um, so she can see that. And really um, what this is, is it's an expectation for me to utilize and enjoy them when she gives them to me, right? She, the expectation is not that I'm going to throw them away or give them away, or she wouldn't give them to me. It is that I will do something with them. Um, so the gifts bind the giver and the receiver together. Another lame example, think about um, Ralphie in his bunny suit, right? That he gets for Christmas um, and that he has to wear it to make somebody feel good. <laughs> he doesn't want to wear it, um, but there is an expectation that he does. And so, um, oh yeah, so read, if you ever have time, read the parable of the shrewd manager. It's in First Peter four and it's um a parable that jesus tells and he basically talks about um the responsibility <coughs> of gifts given to different um uh workers when this manager leaves and um what responsibility they have to those um i won't go into it for time's sake but read it if you have time um it's a it's a good it's a good analogy and and picture for um what i'm talking about with these gifts so for tonight's discussion, like we're just going to operate under the fact that um, an assumption that we have Christians have been given gifts from God, right? And those gifts have created a responsibility to use them in a reciprocal gift back to him. So God has given us something in our hearts, in our minds, the way we think, um, many of us utilize them in our, in our professions, um, and we have a responsibility to um, use them back in a reciprocal gift to God. So we must honor the relationship that he's created with those. And what does that look like? Well, he gave them to us so that we would use them in his kingdom, right? So that we would further his kingdom and make it better. Um, why do we need them? I mean, I think if anything we've learned this year that we are just in this super fallen, broken world. Um, they, these gifts stretch far beyond any of your hard skills that he's given you, right? If someone is um, sitting there tonight and works in engineering, they, he gave you a mind for that and that's wonderful and you should be using that in your job but the gifts that he's given you also stretch far beyond that so um for the stay-at-home mom i mean the gifts of patience that he's given you those stretch far beyond anything that you will do inside the walls of your home they stretch to your community and out to the world um the best example of this is probably the redemption of the fall of humanity um, Adam and Eve obviously eat the apple, there's the fall of humanity, and then God redeems them with Jesus. And so he's not just redeeming us, um, and saying, go out and be better. But what he's doing is actually redeeming, um, souls. He's redeeming my own brokenness, but I would argue he's also asking us to redeem companies systems, industries, um, governments, all of those things need redemption, right? Not just me as a broken person who has made mistakes, but a system within an industry that doesn't function right because people aren't using the gifts that God gave them to do that. And he might have big plans for this company within this industry to change it. Um, and we have a responsibility towards that. So I hope that blows your mind a little bit that these responsibilities stretch far beyond your day-to-day -day work. They go cosmic.
think about that. Um, Yes. Okay. So salvation, I'm sorry. I'm, I have to look at these notes, but salvation is also not just for people. It's for um, all of these other things. And that's what integrates us all together. So how do we actually do this every day um, in life as moms? Our work as moms, employees, um, bosses, whatever that is, um, a lot of times they're looked at um, in two different ways. So an instrumental worth, which is basically like the person that hangs around the water cooler waiting for someone to come up and then says, let me tell you about Jesus <laughs> or invites them to church, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, it's the inviter. It's the person that sees their, their value as um, very, or, and I'm sorry, I got them confused. Instrumental. This is instrumental, not intrinsic. That's the next one. Um, instrumental value. And so that could be something that you just are drawn to naturally. And then there's an intrinsic wor worth, which is basically that your work or your gift is an instrument that you use to then um, further the kingdom. So this could you look like um, volunteer work. This could look like making more money so you can give more money is probably the way that it's looked at the most often. So both have value in all the work that you do. Um, but let's go back to the example of patience. So your gift of patience, it affects your children, right? It affects um, your ability to maybe be patient with a department on a work deadline for a project um, and not build resentment so that you can stay in good relationship with that department. Um, I'll give you an example of a personal one. So I have a gift of empathy, which I knew I was always empathetic, but has anyone ever taken an emotional IQ test or it's called an EIQ? Um, I had to take one for this fellowship and it was equal parts great and not so great because it makes you really look into yourself and see where those strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, but I, I did find that I do have this um, just innate gift that God gave me of empathy for people. So I can feel deeply for my kids. Um, when I hear something happened on the playground, I can like visualize myself teleporting to the playground, probably drop kicking a kid. No, I wouldn't do that. But like just feeling so deeply for them in that moment that I know um, it is not to tell them that they're not to play with that kid anymore. Really my responsibility in that moment is to meet them in the hurt and disappointment. And then we can talk about not playing with the kid later. Um, I can also sit with a friend whose um, child has been um, diagnosed with epilepsy for over a year now. We've known that. And I I have just an ability, God gave me empathy. And I truly think that one of the reasons he did is so that I can sit with her um, through the pain that she has experienced in this last um, year and a half. But so I can use these things inside the walls of my home and that's important, but, um, and okay. So let's just talk about inside the walls of your home really quick, because this is another big thing that I learned from this last year. Um, I know this is a, a tangent, but I want to talk about a quiet revolution. And I forgot where I heard this, um, sometime last year, but, um, we've really been asked by God to take part in his quiet revolution as moms. And this, um, best example of this is obviously the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how like I never felt called to go protest um, but what I felt called to do was do the hard work inside the walls of my home right so this is every day over time so with our kids and our spouses eventually our families this is every day over time like the love of people is not changed overnight it is changed within the hearts of a generation so rest assured like when you feel like maybe you are failing in all areas keep in mind that you never take a day a minute an hour off of the quiet revolution that you're fighting for his kingdom inside the walls of your home so you have worth there regardless of anything that has happened in the last 24 hours or whatever that might look like okay Back to empathy. So um, 
So empathy is also used um, at work. So I can feel deeply for my employees' frustrations, um, like truly put myself in their shoes, um, make them feel heard, but it also allows me to lead vertically or lead up. I work for somebody who's just entrepreneurial in nature, has owned his own business for almost eight years. And has I, he told me, he's like, I've never been led before. And here you are like leading and you're not even above me. Um, and again, like these are just things that have come naturally to me. It's a gift of empathy, but I can put myself in his shoes and see where he's coming from and make him feel like he has a sounding board and a partner in these things. These are not hard skills that God's given me that I've developed this is something soft that he gave me, just a gift, an unfree gift because gifts aren't free, but a reciprocal gift. So I hope those examples help a little bit. Um, and in closing, I just want to get you guys thinking about a couple of things. What are your gifts? So what are those like truly, truly natural things, um, things that you're drawn to that you maybe just can't help but be good at, you can't help but do, think about it as maybe something you viewed as a weakness before. Like I can't help but, I can't help but just get, you know, worked up about this. Well, maybe there's a gift that lies inside there somewhere. Um, and then my next charge is of course, to go use them. Um, so think about them and then go use them. Go use them in your relationships with your kids, your coworkers, um, how you approach your spouse. Maybe uh, it helps you reframe the way you solve a problem at work. Um, what is something that God gave you that he's waiting for his reciprocal gift back that you can go and use? You have a responsibility to do that. You have kingdom responsibility to go and change the world with those things that he's given you. Um, when you approach the throne at the end of this life, God is never going to sit there and say, why weren't you mother Teresa? Right. Or why weren't you, you know, I don't know, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like some um, amazing women. Why weren't you these people? No, God is going to sit there and say, Ingrid, why weren't you you? Like, why weren't you you? Why didn't you use the gifts that I had already given you? I gave you those gifts. I gave Mother Teresa her own set of gifts that she went and used. So that's always going to be the question is just why weren't you you? And you want to be able to approach the throne and say, I was me. And he'll say, good work, my daughter, right? Um, so I encourage you to just go and discover them, um, steward them in ways that start to um, show themselves to you. Maybe they're circumstances that you've not seen before just because you've never been aware of these, of these things. Um, and then just go be you, mama. Just go be you. Um, with your kids and your relationships there um, at work and all those other places. So I hope you found a little bit of um, value in this. It's just been something that was really eye-opening to me in this last year and really helped me reframe how I'm approaching some of um, all aspects of my life actually in this year um, and really trying to steward those gifts um, that God's given me. And I hope this has helped and inspired some of you guys to do the same. So um, thanks for letting me come talk and see you guys again. I miss you. I wish I was there in person and not on the screen, but um, in due time and um, stay safe. And I love you guys.